everyone. Thank you for joining this talk. My name is Tabitha Dobbins, and I'm excited to talk to you today. Thank you to Brian, Claire, and Jenny, and all others who work on the Light Stuff Project. This is a fantastic opportunity to, while we're at home, working from home, to actually get a little bit of uh, more learning in on, um, on scattering x-rays and neutrons. So I'm going to talk to you today about quasi-elastic neutron scattering. And um, this is a technique that helps us to understand the dynamics of our material systems. And in particular, my material system I've been studying for a long time is the hydrogen storage material. Uh, the particular one I'm studying is sodium aluminum hydride. And let's just jump into the motivation for doing these types of studies. So I have been doing scattering uh, work for of, of a variety of types for, for quite a number of years years. I've been studying the hydrogen storage material problem for quite a long time. And the key things that we don't quite understand is the role of the transition metal catalyst in that material system. And we don't quite have a strong handle on the role of nanostructuring either. So this talk combines the two effects of adding the transition metal catalyst and also nanostructuring the material. And this talk really builds upon work that we did when we were looking using quasi-elastic neutron scattering of nano-confined uh, sodium aluminum hydride alone. We didn't have the catalyst added into that material. And we published that work uh, back in 2016 and it's highlighted here on your screen. Okay, so to continue on, um, let's uh, understand the problem a little bit more, the significance of this problem. And so we began looking at hydrogen storage materials for the application of uh, proton exchange membranes in automotive applications. So you have an electric vehicle, and instead of having a battery to, uh, to power up the uh, electric motor, you would have this proton exchange membrane. And what this membrane does is it takes hydrogen in as a dimer, and at a platinum or palladium catalyst, the hydrogen dissociates into a proton and electron. And so the electrons are not permitted through this uh, plastic or polymer membrane membrane, and instead they go through the external circuit where they power up the device that you need uh, electricity for, and at the other side you have a very clean running process because only moisture is delivered. But if we want to use this in automotive applications, we have to be concerned with how do we carry the hydrogen on board in a vehicle in a way that's safe and efficient and um, delivers the hydrogen effectively. And so we're really talking about going uh, in technology from a petrochem generation to a hydrogen generation. And so here we have several uh, Department of Energy defined targets, and I'll just point out a few of those for you for these material systems. And I just wanted to give you more background before I come to the scattering studies so you understand what we're looking for. So in the scattering studies, when we're looking at hydrogen dynamics, we're looking at effects that could be thermodynamic or kinetic effects. And so you can see that many of the over overall targets uh, set aside by the Department of Energy are related to the kinetics and the thermodynamics of the material. Well, the system weight percent, their target is about six weight percent, and that's really uh, a, really a, um, determined by the composition of the material, not the behavior of it. But then the operating temperature, the temperature that it desorbs the hydrogen at, that's a thermodynamic and kinetic pr parameter, as well as the uh, startup time. That means the amount of time it takes to begin to release the hydrogen, deliver the hydrogen gas at high enough pressure uh, for the fuel cell to begin to operate effectively. And then the cycle life determines uh, the, um, the kinetics and thermodynamics, the temperature and pressure at which the hydrogen goes back onto the material, and then the temperature at which it's released and the temperature and pressure at which it goes back on again. So these parameters are really um, defined by the fundamentals of the material, and that's why we want to undertake studies in neutron scattering to understand these things. So things like what is the role of the transition metal catalyst? And are the limitations that we're seeing really kinetic limitations, or are we really transitioning into a new thermodynamic reaction in our material system? And then most importantly, when we, uh, when we have tools that are, are 
at, at our disposal at neutron facilities, at synchrotron facilities? What new information can we bring? How can we utilize these tools in different ways to reveal things, uh, fundamental insights about the material? And so, Again, the model system that I've been looking at is sodium aluminum hydride, and it has a tetrahedral crystal structure. You can see here, hydrogen is in the interstitial sites, and this material releases hydrogen in a two-step reaction. The first step delivers about 3.7 weight percent hydrogen at about 183 degrees C, and the second step delivers another 1.9 weight percent hydrogen, but at about 350 degrees C. So in practice, this second reaction reaction is a little bit too high of a temperature reaction, and we often only look for driving this first step in the reaction if we're, if we're looking at that as our thermodynamic system. And so it was a real uh, transformation in thought in 1997 when work by, by Bogdanovic and Swigardi uh, to adding titanium uh, catalysts to this material were able to enhance the reverse reaction. Before then, this material would release hydrogen, but the reverse of uptake of hydrogen at, at temperatures and pressures that were reasonable to achieve, it wasn't easily uh, possible. So before then, we were really dealing with transition Metal, uh, transition metal compounds and hydrogen is nowhere in the stoichiometries as you look at these graphs. The hydrogen is, that means hydrogen was not occupying every single unit cell and that means that this is a very, these were very low weight percent hydrogen systems but the hydrogen was able to diffuse through, uh, reside in the interstitial and release from these materials. And along came the development of Bogdanovic and Swigardi to this new material system. And then came many, many material systems being studied uh, for this application. Now, the key here is that uh, we want to have a temperature that is low enough that it can the, the desorption reaction can be run from the waste heat of the fuel cell. We want to have a high enough uh, theoretical weight capacity to meet the Dep Department of Energy system targets. And so our um, weight percent in our sodium aluminum hydride, which is found over here, is just not high enough of a weight percent. But we still can gain insight and fundamental um, understanding Standings from studying this material by trying to push the, uh, trying to manipulate the material so we push the temperature of desorption down. And once we understand how that, how those things work, then we can try it with some of these more promising uh, weight percent compounds that would be up higher here. So uh, just to review the effect of the catalyst, we, uh, we talked about adding transition metals to these materials and titanium actually operates the best at driving the reverse reaction. And there were more studies even done on the desorption reaction with titanium. And you can, you can read about that work and we have some publications in that work. But today I wanna draw your attention to what happens when we both catalyze it with the transition metals such as titanium, but we also also nano confine the material. And in our earlier work, we used the metal organic framework uh, FEBTC. This metal organic framework has pore pockets that are about three to five nanometers in size. And what that means is that we could put about uh, somewhere around um, 30 to 50 unit cells inside of this pore if we were able to fill the pores. Now, we were not the first people to uh, actually consider nano confining this material. This work had been undertaken since uh, 2009 by several groups, but we thought that quasi elastic neutron scattering could give insight into some of the arguments that were happening in the literature. So several groups who did this type of work, by the way, all the groups that did this type of work noticed that there was a lower desorption temperature. And so this was, this was really a, a fantastic finding, but the argument was whether this was a kinetic effect, meaning that we have more surface diffusion, or whether this would be a thermodynamic effect, meaning that we uh, changed the entire uh, reaction mechanism. And so we destabilized the compound and changed the entire desorption mechanism and the entire desorption reaction. So... We thought we could give insights into that with neutron scattering. So why use neutrons? As you, 
as you already know, the um, X-rays are scattered from the electrons around the nucleus. And so what that means is that the more electrons around the nucleus we have, the higher is the X-ray scattering cross-section. And so we end up having a, a Z dependence, a, a, a atomic number dependence uh, that is very strong. And so hydrogen gives very little scattering when we use X-rays. Alternatively, neutrons scatter from the nucleus and we get a large um, scattering uh, cross-section from neutrons uh, from hydrogen when we scatter with neutrons, but that's not the only part of the story here. It turns out that the incoherent scattering, that's that disorganized scattering, that's the, the out-of-phase scattering. We also see it as a contribution to our background noise oftentimes. That uh, incoherent scattering signal, because we're not trying to do diffraction and precisely pinpoint the atomic position, the incoherent scattering signal is also valuable to us when we use um, quasi-elastic neutron scattering. And we can see that for hydrogen, the incoherent scattering length is quite high at about 80 barns. And so this um, would be a consideration when you look into doing this technique with your samples to understand the, um, the dynamics of, of of the atom that you're interested in. It's, it's great to have a, um, a high scattering cross-section, but it's, it's, even, it's even more helpful if you have a high incoherent uh, scattering cross-section to do those types of experiments. So we went to the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, the Center for Neutron Research, we, uh, that's the NCNR, and we went there to carry out our experiments. That, um, that facility has two instruments that can measure quasi-elastic neutron scattering. Those are the disc chopper instrument and the high flux backscatter instrument. They differ in the uh, temperature range and the, the dynamics. So the HFBS instrument is better for your uh, lower temperature and, and uh, slower dynamic systems. And the collaborators there were Craig Brown and Madhu Tayagi. I believe they are on the call today. And when we get to Q&A, they may have some, um, some input at that time. And um, the earliest work that we did, you'll find it. Uh, you'll find information about the about the researchers and maybe some additional publications by them about the instrumentation. This this talk will talk primarily about this one specific problem of looking at the sodium aluminum hydride. So just to review the problem uh, and review what we know from the literature, um, the sodium aluminum hydride has this two-step reaction that we went over. But it turns out that theoretical work done uh, in 2010 by Mueller and Cedar showed that if you were able to nanoconfine such that you had two to ten formula formula units of the sodium aluminum hydride, then you completely change the reaction pathway to one that looks like this. So really effectively, it looks like we've skipped over to the final uh, step of the reaction that in the undoped and unnanoconfined system, it was happening in about 350 degrees C. And now we can see it's happening, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a single step reaction. And so uh, further work by Mazu Bedal shows that um, at 100 degrees C approximately, we get a single step reaction. They predicted a different, uh, a different reaction pathway, but this was with eight formula units. And that was when we set about um, setting up our experiments and looking at the nano confinement and the technique that we used would be described in this paper. It's just a vacuum infiltration. So we used a tetrahydrofuran. We put the sodium aluminum hydride in it and we exposed it to the moth and we uh, vacuum uh, pulled vacuum on it to infiltrate it and followed by a rinse step. That, that technique is highlighted here, but also in our paper. And we did quasi-elastic neutron scattering. Again, we've already published the results on the undoped material. And what we saw uh, specifically is that there were two ranges of motion, a long range and a localized motion. The localized motion would be slow. And the percent hydrogen went from 7 to 18% when we were micro versus nano. And we had greater than 40% hydrogen undergoing this long long range, uh, faster motion. And that's all work published here. But now we wanted to look at what happens when we both nano confine the material and we catalyze the material. 
So for that study, we used, uh, we switched up our, our material to this mesoporous silica. Uh, it's a SBA 15 material, and it has pore sizes that are around uh, 8 to 10 nanometers. And we nano confined that material, and then we uh, took it again to quasi-elastic neutron scattering at the NIST Center for Neutron Research. Before taking it, we wanted to confirm that we had achieved nano confinement. So with that, you're looking here at uh, BET surface area measurements with nitrogen gas. And so we can see that um, the curves look very similar, but what you're looking at is the scale of the curves. This is the volume of porosity in cubic centimeters per gram uh, here as the maximum scale. And you can see it's about a, a, third, uh, a third less available pore space for the nitrogen gas to absorb onto, so that means that our material has uh, infiltrated those pores. And then when we transform that data into actual pore size or pore half width, then we can see in the blue curve, it's before infiltration, we see that the larger pore, it gets actually a smaller size. And we can see that the smallest pores are nearly, the, the, um, the amount of them is, is, is uh, greatly reduced. So we're filling up these uh, smallest pores in that uh, SBA 15. So nano confinement is indeed achieved. But then we want to know, are there the effects of nano confinement that were reported in the literature uh, that I showed you before? And for that, we use differential scanning colorimetry. It's just a, uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's just a thermodynamic technique where we measure heat flow. That means we're going to find out if there are exothermic or endothermic reactions as we ramp up the temperature in our material. So first, what I want to draw your attention to is the solid line. This is our bare sodium aluminum hydride. And what you can see is that we get this huge uh, exothermic peak happening when we hit 183 degrees C. That's the that's corresponding to this particular reaction. And then um, we can see that if we take the material and we don't nano confine it, we just add the titanium chloride dopant to it at a at a at a four mole percent. Then we can see that we've slightly decrease the, the temperature of this reaction, but we also see that we've onset a second reaction that happens at about 115 or 118 degrees C, and it's, um, well, I won't elaborate further on what that reaction is. The material that we were more interested in is this uh, four mole percent of, of sodium aluminum hydride, but nano confined in the SBA 15. And by the way, before I get there, I wanna point out that the bare SBA 15 by itself, we want it com to confirm that what we're looking at is, is not some desorption from the SBA 15. And so that's the red curve here. We don't see any endothermic or exothermic peaks on the material as a function of the ramp up and ramp down. And, um, but then when we we look at our um, nano confined and doped material, we see this feature here, and we also saw this feature when we nano confined in the metal organic framework. It's at about 100 degrees C, and it's an exothermic peak, and we think it's uh, attributable to the desorption reaction, the single step desorption reaction that was reported in the literature before. So now we think that we have um, we have a material that's undergoing a behavior change. We've confirmed that it's nano confined and it's undergoing a behavior change. So now we're ready to take it to quasi elastic neutron scattering. So what you're looking at here is your traditional uh, neutron scattering framework. This would be if you were doing small angle neutron scattering. This is the this is the framework, and this is the same uh, wave vector that you're traditionally familiar with, and so uh, four pi over lambda sine of the half angle. Um, it gives you your wave vector Q. Now, I have to apologize here for the lowercase Q here. It's the same thing as the, um, as the uppercase Q here in the, in, the, um, in the scattering data. So now what you're looking at at the bottom are the image of the scattering data, these two images. And I'll first draw your attention to the image on the left. And so for this image, what you're looking at is the sodium aluminum hydride, and there is very little quasi-elastic scattering at the temperature that we're measuring. The red is simply a beam stop. It's not indicative of data. This is your beam, beam blocker, but your scattering data is now in this green and blue area here. And so um, 
So now, if we compare that to the nano-confined material at even a lower temperature, then what we see is that we have tons of uh, quasi-elastic uh, scattering. And so how do we interpret this signal? The first thing that we do is we, the, the, the data is collected as these image data that you see here, but the first thing that we do if we want to model the data and interpret the data is that we want to point out a single uh, Q. So we end up looking at plots that are extracted at a single Q, and that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at a Q, uh, a wave vector of 1.1 inverse angstroms, and you're looking at the data that of, of E. Um, on the last slide, E was your y-axis data. And I'll go back and show that. Okay, so now you're looking at E at a single Q, and now you're, um, now uh, let me explain what, what this is. Your open circles are your raw data. So it's a lot going on in this uh, piece of image. Your open circles are your raw data. And so what we've overlaid it with is your elastic signal. So your elastic signal is this curve here. And this elastic signal means that if there was no hydrogen motion at all, then you're, you would only have the elastic signal. And this is what the, the, the dotted trace uh, is what it would look like. But because the, you have hydrogen dynamics, you have these quasi-elastic tails here. And so, um, so what we end up doing is we end up modeling the quasi-elastic tails with a Lorentzian or two Lorentzians in this case. It just depends on your data whether it, the model will fit with one or two Lorentzians. And so in this case, the model fits with two Lorentzians, and the broader Lorentzian is indicative of faster uh, motion of the hydrogen. The narrow Lorentzian is indicative of slower motion of the hydrogen. So what we do is we extract these Lorentzian uh, models, and we take that data, and we interpret it into several parameters. The two parameters that's extracted from each Lorentzian is the full width half max. And if we track that as a function of Q, then that tells us whether our motion was localized or long range. And again, we do this with each of the Lorentzians. So we get a full width half max for the broad and a full width half max for the narrow. And we track both of those with Q, giving us more information about our, our motion, our slow motions, our slower motions, and our faster motions. And it's important to say here that when I say slow and fast, this is relative to each other and relative to the, to the frame of the instrument. And so the other parameter that we extract is called the elastic and coherent structure factor or the EISF. The EISF is simply a ratio of amplitudes. It's the amplitude of the elastic signal over the amplitude of the elastic plus the amplitudes of the two Lorentzians. So this is the formula for it over here. And what I just want to point out to you as a starting point for, and for digesting this and interpreting it is that if you had no uh, quasi-elastic tails and therefore you have very low or no amplitude to the, uh, to the Lorentzians, then you would end up with an EISF of 1. And the ESF of one means that you have 0% uh, mobile hydrogen. So this is an, a way that we can track the mobile fraction, the fraction of mobile hydrogen. And finally, uh, we can apply a model, the appropriate model apply it will give us our jump lengths. And that same model will independently give us our fraction of mobile hydrogen. So we can compare that to what we, what we get when we observe just our EISF parameter. This is where I would stop and say, are there questions? But I think that um, I think that in this format we have to keep going. So let's keep going. And so what we, what you can extract from that is that we can take each of our samples. So this is now three different sample conditions. This is both nano confined, but at two different temperatures in the micron sample at a different temperature. And again, we're looking at a single Q vector and extracting these parameters uh, for all of that data. So let's have a look at the data. 
So uh, here, we're first gonna look at the narrow Lorentzian data that's indicative of the slower motion. And we're checking first the full width half max and how it behaves with the scattering wave vector. And we see that since it's fairly constant with scattering wave vector for, the, for all of the samples, that this motion is localized. If the motion, and you can, you can look into our paper that, um, not the paper that's not to be, the, that's the one from 2016, if you look into that paper, Paper, you'll see a case where the uh, where the as we go down in Q vector we end up trending towards zero and that's a long range motion case but as we don't trend to zero as we have a very uh, a fairly flat um, a very flat um, full with half max as a function of Q this motion is localized so we can say now one conclusion is that our slower motion is a localized motion what about the quantity of it? For that, we have to look at the EISF. And looking at the EISF, the first set of data we're looking at here is just our micron size, um, our micron size sodium aluminum hydride. And um, the micron size was uh, also titanium doped. And we can see that, as I explained earlier, that we would have an EISF of one if there was no quasi-elastic scattering, but we see this drop off and this leveling out. And so this EISF is around, um, is around, um, is, is, is around, uh, I guess, the it gives us a percent mobile hydrogen of around two and a half. So I guess that puts it around 97.5. Now, if we looked at the if we looked at the other samples, the nano-confined and dope samples, then we see we're leveling off at about 15% mobile hydrogen. So we see that we go from 2.5% mobile hydrogen to about 15% mobile hydrogen on the, uh, small, uh, on the localized uh, uh, slower motion uh, hydrogen atoms. Now, let's look at the uh, broad Lorentzian, and the broad Lorentzian uh, full width half max, again, doesn't change as we very much as we, as we uh, vary Q. So we have these large error bars, and the one thing I forgot to say earlier, if you uh, undertake this type of measurement, it's going to depend on your sample, but the, a single sample and a single condition measurement could take up to about six to eight hours of measurement time. And so it's very important to... Um, it's very important to allocate the, the correct amount of time or to prioritize your samples. These are very long measurements. Otherwise, you might get uh, very, very large error bars. So we have to collect for a very long time on this technique. But still, we can, we can say that this uh, faster motion doesn't, doesn't change very much with Q. And so we can say that this is still localized motion for this faster motion. And again, looking at the elastic and coherent structure factor, the EIS, now we can see it's about 58% or more of, uh, of, of, of this, um, of this uh, faster motion that is localized. And so we can say or more because as you can see in the other samples, we actually see a leveling off. So we actually collect the data out to a queue where we see a leveling off. But at, at the queue that we continue collecting the data to, to for this sample, we actually don't see a leveling off. So we don't really know whether the data would go like this or whether it would continue downwards or and so forth. But it's a, but this EISF is indicative of greater than 50 58% mobile hydrogen, we can say that as a certainty. And so as the time is running out, I will now get to the models. Uh, we chose a six site isotropic model that's six equivalent sites for most of our samples. And we experimented with three different models or four different models for the, um, for the final um, for the final um, sample. Uh, long story short, we were able to get jump lengths that were feasible. We compared it with some uh, quasi-elastic neutron scattering coupled with density functional theory studies done by Shi et al. And they had a bond jump length, a bond length of a hydrogen hydrogen bond length of about 2.6 angstroms. And that corresponds roughly to our jump lengths, which is about two and a half to 2.78. And we also see that our fraction of mobile hydrogen uh, these are coming from the model. 
model. It matches up fairly well with what we saw in our, um, in our, in our EISF experimental data, that it's 15% mobile hydrogen uh, in, in this system. And so in summary, what, what, have, we, what have we learned? Um, we've learned that we, uh, when we t t dope the system uh, with titanium and we just leave it as micro scale, we have 2.5% mobile hydrogen versus 15% when we nano confine it. So this is a, this is that nano confinement does have an effect on the titanium doped sodium aluminum hydride. Uh, and I just wanted to recap the, from the study that we did before, when we nano confined without doping and metal organic frameworks, we had about 18% mobile hydrogen relative to about 7% in the, in the microscale powders that were undoped. Um, we think that there is a loss and we want to have a closer look at that and try to interpret that because we can see that we went from 18% just in the MOF with no doping to about 15% with the titanium present. And not only that, um, uh, the titanium uh, doped uh, micro scale powder had about 2.5% mobile hydrogen. So that titanium may be doing something to inhibit the, the motion of the hydrogen. And it's possible that the, the, that the uh, hydrogen's mobility depends on the mobility of aluminum and the, that it moves in concert. And this has been suggested in the literature before. And if that's the case, titanium aluminite formation may inhibit the motion of hydrogen. Um, we learned from this study that all the mobile hydrogen in these samples had a localized motion, and the same is um, is is um, the same is true for nano confined uh, sodium aluminum hydride in the metal organic framework. And then we also learned that greater than fifty percent, fifty eight percent of the hydrogen is undergoing the uh, faster motion, um, and that was uh, forty percent for the uh, for the undoped samples when we nano confined in moths. So I want to thank the graduate student who did this work. He may be on the call, Shadabish Narase Gauda. He was at Louisiana Tech at the time the data was collected. He's currently at the Intel Corporation. I want to thank the collaborators at the NIST Center for Neutron Research for the quasi-elastic neutron scattering work, Timothy Jenkins, Craig Brown, and Madhu Tayagi. Uh, Craig and Madhu may be on the call today. And I want to thank our funding sources uh, who supported this work and I also want to thank you for your time today. And if you should have any questions, you'll find my email address here at this, um, at this URL. And you can also find it uh, by looking into the Louisiana Tech and uh, Tabitha Dobbins. And I thank you for your time. I draw your attention to our last paper on this topic and our next paper is forthcoming on this topic. And do you have any questions? <laughs>